So let's start. Okay, now with our uh, round table discussion, I'm so happy to have you uh, all here. Uh, uh, so we will dis uh, discuss about per perspectives on digital language teaching. I, I would like to warmly uh, thank you for your participation in the round table. Uh, today we will have uh, in this session, uh, this open discussion and we and the experts will discuss about the latest advances in digital language teaching and the outline perspective for the future development. And also we will have um, a short time also, uh, we will discuss about the digital profile of the language teacher in the pre-pandemic and during the pandemic era. Uh, so uh, our uh, experts uh, today is uh, Professor Ursula Stickler. She's a senior lecturer in the School of Languages and Applied Linguistics at the Open University of UK. Professor Jack Berston, who holds uh, the position of Honorary Research Fellow in the Language Center of the Cyprus University of Technology. And Professor George McCross, who uh, is Professor, he has a, a professor position of the Master Program of Digital Humanities uh, at Hamad bin Khalifa University of Qatar. And also he is an adjunct professor at the Department of Applied Linguistics at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, USA. We start with the first question, uh, uh, that is, which are the latest advances in your research field? So uh, each of the speaker will, will have six, seven minutes to express their opinion okay you will have uh, six seven minutes to express your opinion and uh, uh, but in the meantime if you have questions please uh, send the questions and to make it even more interactive eh? why not Ushi, would you like to start first with your um, opinion so which are the latest advances in your research field Okay, let's talk about that. Um, my research field, as I, as I said before, is technology enhanced language teaching and learning, and particularly online language teaching and, and learning. And when I uh, talk about my research field, everybody first hooks into the technology part of it. And when, when I look at the latest advances, for me, the technology has moved on a lot during the pandemic. So the last one and a half years have seen lots of, of new tools, new tech or adapted technology. But for me, much more fascinating is what happened over the, um, the last year or so in pedagogy advancement. And first of all, the, the major impact was this mainstreaming of online synchronous teaching, not just language teaching, but uh, uh, lots of universities, schools, and so on, have been forced to move the teaching online. And lots of teachers have taken up the challenge of doing synchronous teaching. So not just sending word documents, not just uploading stuff on the VLE, but really engaging with the students in, in video conferencing um, environments similar to what we're using now, using Zoom or whatever they had. This for me was, was important, this mainstreaming, but also that the technology followed this mainstream. So as soon as teachers started moving on to Zoom, um, teachers complained about various features and the technology immediately racked it, which is something that, that we've been trying as, as online language teachers, we've been trying for almost decades now to, to say, could you have these features? Could, could we do this a little bit different? And the technology did not react as quickly, obviously. There were um, developers who, who quickly reacted or who tried out new things, but this mass movement has really advanced, has, has speeded up the, uh, the changes. And the, the second important change in pedagogy I found is that people realize there's a huge difference between what Hodges and others call the emergency remote teaching. So this quick reaction, so I, I can't go into school, I can't. So emergency remote teaching is different to what we call pedagogically sound online teaching. Emergency remote teaching is, is good, it's fine if, if you have to quickly react, but it's not at all the same thing as if you've planned and researched and investigating your, your time and your expertise in moving um, teaching, language teaching online. So that, that for me is um, the, the second important movement, the second advancement over the past year and a half. And the third one is, uh, is also something that, that we've tried to 
implement before uh, colleagues have been talking about the use of tools either for private or for um, for teaching means and uh, due to the, the enforced move into home office for lots of people, the setting of boundary has become a public discussion feature. So that this is something that people talk about now. How do I make sure that my Facebook page that I use with my family is not invaded by students? How make, do I make sure that my students, when they're using a, um, uh, any kind of tool, that their privacy is protected? So that, that's my three points of advance advancements in language teaching. So thank you so much. We have uh, a question here, uh, not it's a comment. Okay, I got a study based on language innovation as a reflection of vocabulary creation and word formation on internet community forums, how the, that creation and the frequency of adapting the newly created words play a role in English language students. Okay. Thank you for that, Havra. I, I think that that's less of a question, it's more of a, of a comment, and it might refer to what, what Jack has been talking before about the mm -hmm. creativity and, and having the playfulness and the fun come back into language teaching. And that definitely links to what I've been saying, this, this emergency remote teaching is no fun. There's no space for fun. There's no space for creativity. It's just, we have to get this done now. We have to work with what, what we've been given. And where the creativity comes back <coughs> in is once the, the teacher training has taken effect, once the adaptation to the online tools and online spaces has, um, has become possible. Jack, you wanted to comment on that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it is your part now. <laughs> Professor Berson, uh, would you like to share also your view? Yes. Um, latest advances in language teaching. I think, actually, I covered a lot of that in my, in my talk uh, because ubiquitous digital technology is playing such an important role. But there's another aspect that I didn't get into uh, which is very closely related to ubiquitous digital technology, and that's blended learning. I see blended learning becoming more, uh, more frequent, more frequently applied uh, with or without mobile technology. And by definition, blended learning has two parts, the out-of-class part and the in-class part. And it's uh, certainly in the out-of-class part where the digital technology is having its greatest effect. Uh, tutorial applications, as I said, continue to dominate, but they are, in, in terms of latest advances, these tutorial applications are becoming more intelligent. Uh, they are adapting to students. They are um, uh, quizzing them intelligently using space learning. Uh, and, and, and reinforcement. Uh, gaming is a major aspect of uh, the tutorials now, sugarcoating, if you will, the, uh, the tutorials. Um, there are other areas where the technology uh, can be used. Uh, simulated writing and spoken, written and spoken dialogues uh, using the technology to simulate dialogues. Uh, automatic writing correction, now that's been around for a while. Uh, the research on it is very interesting. Uh, it turns out that the automatic writing correction corrects on a par with human, uh, human correctors. Um, the uh, virtual reality programs, well, they've been out there for a while. Uh, the extension of that, and right now, I think technologically, the cutting edge uh, is in augmented reality. I have qualms about that because it is so, by definition, technology oriented uh, and very technology heavy. Uh, it is not transparent the way tablets and smartphones are. People don't carry around with them these uh, virtual reality uh, devices. Uh, the peer correction out of class for individual writing, collaborative writing, 
these are all things that can be done in class, but uh, they can be done very well out of class as well. And I think increasingly using the uh, ubiquitous technical devices to support uh, collaborative task-based situated learning, uh, sending students out to, to do things in the, in the real world. Uh, and not just beginner intermediate level, uh, this also has applications, uh, discipline applications and job related applications. Uh, people in um, tourism and hotelry, for example, have got to learn languages and they've got to learn languages in their, uh, related to their job. And I see that happening. And then lastly, out of class web-based research projects. Uh, there, there's an infinite, that, you know, given the, the, the enormity of the internet and, and what you can find out there, uh, there's no end to the uh, kind of um, web-based research projects that you can set students on. The second part of the equation is what happens in class afterwards. Uh, Obviously, for the tutorial exercises, whatever they're doing out of class, you, you want them to, to come back into class and use that vocabulary and use that, uh, uh, that grammar uh, to communicate with each other. For the task-based related activities, uh, even before the task, uh, engaging students in class, in the groups uh, that they're going to be in, uh, to uh, participate in filling out the detail of the uh, task. It's the instructor's uh, uh, responsibility to set the overall framework, uh, but you can get a lot of mileage in class with, within these groups in the second language, discussing the details of where they're going to go, what they're going to see, who they're going to talk to, what kind of questions they're going to ask, etc. cetera. Uh, once they complete their, their, uh, their projects, again, you want them to bring them back into the classroom. And, and discuss them, uh, fill out final details, come to final conclusions about uh, the, the things that they are uh, learning. And then ultimately have some sort of in-class uh, uh, production. Uh, typically these are um, uh, oral presentations, but they could be written as well and they could be web, web pages uh, as well. Uh, so these, these are where I see the the latest advances in language teaching. They're related to application of uh, ubiquitous technical uh, digital technology within a blended learning framework. Thank you so much, okay. wonderful. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know if you, have, if you have any questions related to what we have just heard. Um, okay. Uh, so if not, we will continue afterwards. Uh, we will have uh, also the, your questions. Uh, Professor Mikros, what's your view on the latest advances in your research field? Thank you, Maria. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's an amazing uh, forum of uh, experts and people really interested in language, uh, teaching languages and technology. And the keynotes I just heard were amazing. And thank you, Ursi and Jack. Very, very uh, thoughtful and uh, spot on uh, approaches. So my own uh, specialization is uh, in natural language processing, computational linguistics and AI in language. So talking about what happened in the last, uh, I would say four or five years in artificial intelligence is like um, uh, trying to narrate the history of the human race. <laughs> so it's, too condensed, there have been so many uh, amazing uh, uh, different things. Uh, I will try to summarize what happened, what's happening right now in the automatic analysis of languages using computers. And uh, one big thing that really uh, changed completely the way that computers interact with language is the deep uh, neural network structures that have been arise. So we now have huge networks neural networks that can uh, really understand human language uh, in a way that is very, very close to the human brain, how the human brain understands human language. And we can see that because all these um, models are actually surpassing human evaluations. Uh, they're better at the many, many language tasks that 
than, than humans. And this is really uh, interesting and at some point might be a little shocking. But uh, this is what is happening right now. And uh, we're having this huge language models like the GPT-3 and others that are coming right now after, the, after it. And uh, it seems that they're really game, changes, game changers. They, they really uh, can do quite a lot of stuff. So um, what can we say about these uh, um, evolvements in terms of uh, how these evolvements uh, intersect uh, language teaching and in general um, uh, learning and teaching languages? So one thing that we will see in the near future, and we already have seen uh, quite a lot of applications emerging, is uh, uh, that we will have systems that can, could actually um, grade essays evaluate essays and even provide feedback on these essays. So one point I want to, to, uh, to share with you is that we having now an era where uh, the instant feedback from the machine will be available. And the feedback will not be that just a holistic grade, like you, you gave an essay and you just get a number. This is something we, we already did that in the 2010, 2012. But now uh, we will get back real feedback and real evaluation of what you wrote. So one uh, very important, I think, advantage is this. The other is that um, modern AI can offer a deeper involvement in the learning process. So uh, now the big language models can actually create texts. We already have a number of uh, novels that have been written actually from, from these language models. Uh, we have literature, we have a lot of texts that uh, are being generated automatically. Uh, we have art actually generated and being sold in, in a lot of uh, auctions uh, and being uh, sold quite expensively. So we do expect that uh, uh, in a couple of years we will have a lot of uh, language teaching material be created by machines and not by humans and also being specified and individualized and be very relevant to the, the learners groups, learner aids, learner interests. Uh, another thing I, I really see coming is, and already exists of course, is the language boat and the conversational agents. And um, in, in my age, when I wanted to, to learn to a new language that I really wanted to go and practice my conversation skills, either I should go to a private tutor or uh, a school, a language school, or maybe I, I could have a, a, a pen, um, a pen friend. Uh, it was very difficult to actually uh, imitate the conversational, interactional skills in language learning. Uh, right now, we have a number of very, very advanced language conversational bots that offer native language uh, experience to the to the people that are trying to learn a new language. Language. So we have, for example, Duolingo's uh, platform that has created a very, very uh, persuading, um, convincing uh, uh, language board. We have Andy, um, and, and they're coming all, all the time. Um, a fourth point, I would say, is the, the machine translation. You know that uh, machine translation was always um, the, the point where people uh, actually said that, okay, we have uh, the advancement of AI, but look what's happening. Uh, machine translation fails, fails miserably. And have a look at, at what they are actually, uh, are the outcome of these translations. And you will see that here is where a man, human actually uh, uh, does better, way better than the machine. Actually, uh, this is changing also. Neural translation, uh, translation that's based on neural networks is getting better and better. However, uh, providing neural translation examples to students, to learners, is a, is a very interesting exercise uh, in terms of uh, make them edit this output and make them realize what, what are the, the inconsistencies in, in a human uh, machine translation system. So it can be used very, very creatively in the, um, in the learning process. And uh, last, not least, uh, is that uh, AI methods and uh, services and platforms um, 
I would say um, yeah, implement something that we all want to have in language learning. So they just disappear the fear of failing. Uh, you can't fail in a machine. You, you can be corrected by machine, but you will never, never experience the psychological uh, difficulty of, of uh, confronting someone that tells you you're wrong on, on this uh, linguistic structure. So, uh, and there are, I think, a number of, of uh, already some uh, studies on that, on the psychological effect of a machine actually correcting you. That's much, much more um, uh, easy on your psychology and uh, much more constructive. So, yeah, um, the future is full of presents to all of us. Uh, there are, of course, a lot of, of uh, questions, um, security, privacy, ethical uh, 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 questions. Uh, also, uh, a lot of discussion right now in my field about uh, bias in, in, the, in the language models. You know, bias is, is a huge thing in all these models. Just give you a very brief example and I will finish. Uh, we used to have some kind of collocation exercise using big corpora and uh, language models. And uh, at a specific point, we realized that uh, we had a very weird collocation. So we checked uh, um, Italian cuisine and Italian cu cuisine came with a, with a a big spectrum of very nice things that's a f wonderful, uh, tasty, whatever, and Greek cuisine the same, by the way. So <laughs> there were a number of cuisines that were having a lot of very, very nice collocates. And then we had Arabic cuisine. And uh, as you know, uh, I'm in Doha, uh, in the Gulf country, which is marvelous cuisine, right? <laughs> and I, I got these, uh, these collocates that were really uh, bad. Uh, nasty cuisine uh, or whatever, and we just couldn't realize what's happening. Then we, we, we dig in in the corpus and the, in the collocation analysis of the model, and we realized that Arabic was actually uh, carrying all the bad, bad collocation from the politics, from the terrorism, from the uh, Al Qaeda or whatever. So these models, this language model, have, had encoded this bias, which is a, a regional bias, it's a, maybe it's a gender violence, uh, bias, and they had included that. So uh, any actual application uh, could also offer biased results. So these are just some, um, just the tip of the, of the iceberg about things we can maybe discuss uh, quite more extensively uh, later. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> so I will pass. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Mikros. Uh, we, it was uh, really insightful. And uh, OK, now I have many more questions <laughs> after this, uh, all these replies. Uh, uh, we have a question. Uh, George, do you think that artificial intelligence will be gradually replacing the language teacher? If yes, in which tasks or activities this is most possible? Thank you. Um, uh, excellent question. Actually, I hear this question uh, since from the very, very beginning of my, of my career, my academic career, back in the 90s, uh, when we had this CD-ROM, multimedia CD-ROMs, where we try to teach languages with city roms at that time. And it was the first question actually I had from people working and it's, it's completely, I can fully understand it, uh, understand this. Uh, I would go one step further and uh, uh, really uh, ask you and uh, uh, ask you to reflect, what is a, a language learning process? What, what sort of, of, of activity? Is this something that's completely mechanical uh, or needs uh, a next factor inside this equation? And my own take is that um, language learning is a human activity uh, that needs a speech community around you, support you. So uh, yes, we can enhance this activity with a lot of technology, but we cannot really recreate, imitate a speech community uh, uh, around us, uh, completely artificial. Um, however, uh, uh, because I'm now uh, just realizing that 
we are going into an extended reality uh, mode and world, uh, maybe this actually can be done uh, in, in some uh, distant year. So if metaverse or whatever verse is created, yes, at that time, although this sounds like science fiction, but it's quite uh, possible to have uh, virtual or augmented or extended realities where we can imitate the, these learning processes. Uh, but I think this is somehow far away. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mikros. I'm passing the word to my colleague, Elis Kakoulis Kostantinou from uh, the Cyprus University of Technology. Uh, Elis? Thank you very much, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> she will continue with uh, the next uh, question. Hi, everybody. Uh, a big thank you to our guests for the very insightful views uh, that they have shared with us today. Um, the second point that we would uh, like to invite you to discuss concerns the future developments in language teaching, even though uh, Dr. Migros has briefly touched upon this. Um, I would like to ask you, what will the future developments in language teaching involve, according to your opinion? Uh, Dr. Stickler, would you like to uh, be the first one to uh, comment on this? <laughs> Happy to talk about that again. Uh, but I do not have a crystal ball. I do not know what will happen. But I've got a few ideas, and, and some of them have been mentioned by, by Jack and by, by Georgios as, as, uh, already. Uh, one of the things I found really fascinating is this idea of machine translation as replacing the teacher. We at the Open University, we are just working on integrating machine translation as one of the tools into our teaching materials because we want to teach our students to use the machine to enhance their language learning rather than seeing it as a competition to the teacher. We're still there to, to help them learn the language and we are the speech community as, as you said but we are also the pedagogic experts to, to tell them this is a good use of machine translation, this is maybe not such a good use. Don't, don't expect the machine to think for you, to learn the worldview, to, to switch your epistemology from um, Asian to Indo-European, for, for example. Those are things that still need to be worked out in, in your own brain. But there's lots and lots that the machine can do for you. And machine translation is, uh, I, I've learned so much over the past year with my colleagues, Andre Garget and Karina von Linda Nastraski, when we started experimenting and asking our teachers and our students how they would like to use machine translation. So that's definitely one of the future developments. And I hope it's, it's going to be a pedagogically sound one, and not one driven by fear, because that's, that's the, the great, as, as you said, that's the great fear of, of language teachers. They're going to be replaced. And another aspect that I, I do see coming, and that comes from, from teachers I've worked with as well, is that language is or is becoming or will be a player in the social justice agenda. So it's, it's not just language learning as um, like, like this, this sort of ancillary tool to make to, to for trade or to to make connections with people it is a social justice question and I'm, I'm talking particularly about plurilingualism multilingualism about the, the recognition of heritage languages and and so on so it, it's not not just there to that everybody learns english to be on the same level to to have the best trade deal it is a question of recognizing different language communities of recognizing um, language as as a social benefit of, of people being excluded through, uh, through not using the, the language that has the most capital, the, the social capital as, as well. So that, that's these are thoughts that come from language teachers, in particularly in the global south, and, and they're telling us we ought to look at the dominance of language, uh, what language is doing 
to our students and also how can we encourage a heritage language use and how, how can we make sure that all languages are equally appreciated. So these, these are two things that, that come up. Another one that, that Jack mentioned is uh, the blending of learning. And, and I can see the, the struggle of, of teachers, the, the, the desire of teachers going back into the, the comfort of the face-to-face -face classroom, but also the resistance from, from learners saying, well, now we've experienced how comfortable and how exciting this online learning can be. Why do we have to do the same old thing again? Can't we just use the best of both worlds. And I think that's that's something that's that's coming up as well with the pressure from the learners, as well as with the exciting contribution from, from teachers and the creativity from, from teachers. Um, I'll stop here and wait for, for Jack and, and George to add other things to that as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Berston. Yeah, I'm muted here. Yeah, uh, let me pick up here, first of all, uh, with a, a remark that both uh, Jochios and, um, and Ursula made re regarding the replacement of teachers by machines. Uh, I didn't say it, but there's a, a quote. I really have to track it down. And it goes like this. Any teacher who can be replaced by a machine deserves to be replaced by a machine. Uh, and I think that's, that will hold true. Uh, regarding future developments in language teaching, I'd like to take a short-term pragmatic uh, uh, view of it. That, that is in the next 10 to 15 years, the immediate future. I think in a word, what we're looking at is back to the future. Uh, the it, latest advances, uh, cutting edge technology uh, are, are not what I see driving uh, language teaching in the in the coming say two decades, uh, it's it's not the technology that will drive it. It'll, it'll have to be an extension of the pedagogy. Uh, in terms of what you know, what uh, Rogers uh, set out in the adoption of of uh, technological innovations or innovations in general. Uh, we are currently at uh, what Rogers describes as the early adopters. We have maybe two or three percent of people like us uh, on the cutting edge, and uh, another 12, 13 percent of, of, of adopters, the early adopters. Uh, what I see happening in the future, the next 10, 15 years, is uh, the pedagogies that are there, which I described earlier, extending to a larger part of the teaching profession. Uh, what Rogers refers to as the early majority, that is getting up from 15% to 50%. Uh, and as I said, I don't see this being driven by the technology. And that's not gonna happen spontaneously or automatically. Uh, it's gonna have to be worked on consciously. The, the early doctors themselves right now have to expand. Uh, most of the, the people who are involved uh, are involved in just a small subset of the, of the numerous uh, applications and activities that I referred to earlier. They're going to have to expand from that uh, to uh, more of the activities and also increasing the uh, collaborative activities and the task-based activities. Um, I think we're we need more teacher training here as well. Uh, typically, teachers train the way they learn to students, and that includes uh, teacher trainers. Uh, they train people the way they were trained. Uh, this is why uh, this conservatism is why there is a 20 year time lag between what's happening on the cutting edge, what's happening with the early adopters, and what's happening with everybody else. Uh, but uh, that in, in a word, as I said, uh, it, it's back to the future, uh, uh, applying increasingly uh, what the early adopters are doing now and the early adopters themselves expanding uh, their uh, application of the, of the technology and, and the pedagogies. Okay, questions, comments, complaints? No questions so far. Uh, so we can now move to Dr. Migros. Thank you, Elise. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, 
my initial uh, um, uh, talk about uh, the uh, advancements in AI, of course, uh, spotted the, the, the landscape uh, of the future, but uh, I would maybe uh, add a little uh, two or three things that I see coming in language teaching uh, with the help of technology, of course. One is uh, I see a, a need to uh, change uh, radically the way language competence is tested. I think we are uh, having quite a lot of uh, time right now uh, of uh, using the same methods and the same um, mindset about uh, examining whether someone has learned a language or not. And they say uh, uh, that there is a lot of, in, uh, of advancement uh, in this area, and I think technology can help us on that. One is, uh, so I, I see a lot of potential in, in changing things in language testing. Uh, another thing I see uh, coming is that language learning will be more densely uh, be packed with culture. So uh, right now, technology can help us uh, create multimodal experiences. And uh, this will uh, really facilitate the way we learn languages at the cultural specific setting. And this also will give us uh, more opportunities about individualized uh, approaches to language learning. And um, I would say a uh, uh, third thing I could think of, of changing things is that uh, uh, we need to, to really uh, make uh, train, and I think Jack told us that, that we need to create a, a new model of teacher, right, language teacher. Uh, a teacher that can actually understand uh, the the environment of language learning as, as a as something much much bigger than right now, uh, and I would say that one of the things that the new language teachers should have and they don't have as we speak right now uh, is an extensive training on soft skills, except from the classical technology training. Uh, we need this. Uh, these people to come to a class or to, to lessons with new ideas, uh, more uh, open minds, and definitely uh, visions, visions about uh, where uh, their students can do, what they can do, create narratives of successful uh, integration of language, technology, culture. Uh, that's my thoughts, at least for now. Thank you very much. So, Maria, would you like to move on with the third point? Uh, I can see that there are no questions yet Absolutely. by our audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, the last point is, uh, as I said before in the introduction, we will discuss about the digital profile of the language teacher in the pre-pandemic and during pandemic era. Unfortunately, I cannot say post-pandemic, this, would, this is what I would like to say, but unfortunately, I cannot say it. So, dear Rushi, what do you think? What is the, the digital profile of a language teacher these days? I, I'm glad that I, I was forward for this question because I had to, to look back into material I did uh, years ago when we first started working with the European Centre for Modern Languages. We did uh, teacher training workshops with, with lots of teachers from different countries and by asking them questions, interviewing teachers, going back to them, presenting um, our findings and so on, we, we sort of circled towards a... Um, not the definition, but the vignettes of teacher types in with regards to technology use in language teaching. And those teacher types were things like a person who has not enough time, quite likes, um, likes technology, but hasn't got enough time to really prepare and train for that. So she's hesitant to employing technology in the class, but in principle, positive. Then there's the total skeptics, people who think that computers take away the humanity out of teaching and uh, are detrimental to students learning and so on. So that that's talking uh, about 10, 15 years in, in the past. And we extended these uh, teacher vignettes, teacher types over the years a little bit. So we introduced the, the person who's quite skilled, but needs um, an 
a technology expert on the side who basically implements their creative ideas. So things that, that have developed and then pandemic hit and uh, in, a, in a different context, uh, um, the trajectories and perspectives of language teachers in the 21st century, that's a research network uh, we've set up uh, with, uh, with Isla, has done an additional study of asking teachers, so what will you do 10 years down the line? Mid-pandemic, they've already experienced either enforced or voluntary move to online teaching or blended teaching or at least online elements in their teaching. And we asked them, so 10 years, what are you going to do? And totally different vignettes came out of, of this research, totally different teacher types. Um, for example, the, the, the visionary, uh, things that... that um, George uh, was talking about a visionary, somebody who really embraces technology and always wants to be cutting edge or even further, uh, further uh, away and moving on towards the future. The traditionalist who sort of bemoans the fact that this enforced move to online has left behind all these lovely skills developed in the face-to-face -face classroom. So these are people who still will need convincing uh, of the digital skills needed in, in the future, or they will turn into the, the last category I found, those people who are happy that they will be retired in 2031. So th those, are, those are people. But, but there's also things like the designer, the mediator, people who understand language teaching in the future as a completely different skill set from um, uh, grammar teaching or vocabulary teaching. It's mediating online resources, making them accessible to students, to learners, uh, sort of teaching them how to find a tandem partner, for example, how to communicate with native speakers in a way that's safe and sound and pedagogically valuable. So these, these are my five cents worth of speculation about the digital skills needed in the future based on what language teachers tell us. Thank you so much, Susie. Uh, I see no questions, I think. Okay, so uh, I pass the word to <laughs> Professor Berston, please. Can All you right. also share your view? Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I'm somewhat at a disadvantage here because I'm retired and I haven't talked for several years. But I, I, have, I am able to make some general observations, which I think apply to teachers in general and not just language teachers. Uh, as Ursula said, the, what has come out of the pandemic uh, is survival mode teaching, uh, emergency teaching, which is quite unrelated to uh, the kind of language teaching, teaching in general, but certainly the kind of language teaching that we've been talking about today. Uh, most of the teachers who've been involved in this process, from what I can see, have been thrown in to sink or swim into some form of remote teaching and they had little or no preparation or previous experience. The result of that is, well, most of them have survived, but um, the result uh, th that I've been able to observe has been very teacher-centered and a strictly transmission model of teaching. Um, not learner-centered, certainly not collaborative blended model learning. And of course, by definition, the in-class component was totally missing. As I said, I think most of the teachers and students survived, but I think it's a, a pretty certain uh, guess that their experience was not entirely positive, either for the teachers or the instructors. So the, that experience can cut either way in their future development. I think it's likewise a, a fairly good bet that the language teachers who were already in the early adopter group pre-pandemic uh, would have fared much better than the uh, unprepared language teachers. Uh, they may in fact learn something from this experience and have adjusted their experience, their, their teaching methodologies. I think if anything, it would have reinforced the, their own initial inclination uh, to show that uh, yes, the remote, um, remote teaching, distance teaching, um, blended learning uh, needs to be a part of the teaching 
whether there are pandemics or not. Lastly, the non-adopters, as I said, I think their, their experience could have cut either way. It could have completely put them off any type of uh, blended learning, any type of uh, uh, technology assisted learning because the, the, their experience was so negative. Uh, for some, however, it may be a wake up call. They may have uh, they may have had good results and 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 come around thinking, gee, uh, if I really had training and knew what I was doing, uh, this actually could be a whole lot better than I was able to make it. Uh, for those people, uh, if they got the wake up call, uh, it's very important that they get into institutional support. Uh, they've got to have training. This cannot be done uh, uh, spontaneously. Uh, and they need and they, they need support. Anybody who's been involved, I think Ursula will raise her hand on this. She's always raising her hand anyway. Uh, but <laughs> um, remote teaching, distance teaching, uh, blended teaching involves more work, not less, for the instructor. You, it takes much more advanced planning. Uh, it takes much more support. You got to, and then you have to follow up in the classroom as well. Uh, you can get much better results, but it, as I, I said in my talk, uh, it requires more effort, more engagement, more ingenuity on the part of teachers and students uh, alike. That's my five cents worth. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Burston. Uh, let me see. Okay, I don't see any questions. So, <laughs> Professor Mikros, I will pass the word to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, after Ursi and Jack's uh, comprehensive uh, responses, I actually don't have five cents. I have <laughs> 0 0.005 cents. Uh, actually, I, I fully agree with what they have said. And uh, I, I would just add um, another dimension, uh, which is might be a little funny, but I do think it's relevant to the future digital teacher. And this is to create um, a, a stronger, more robust technological background in, in very simple tasks. Uh, I do believe that uh, it's not that important to know how to use Zoom or WebEx or any other client. I really want to, to see these people, many of these language teachers, to know how to uh, navigate the folders in Windows or in Mac OS or to install and uninstall problems or uh, create some sort of um, technical solutions for them. Uh, I have found it so many times very, very useful for them to know very basic and very functional uh, knowledge about how computers work. I know it's, it, it sounds like uh, uh, we don't need it anymore, but I do think that uh, a basic technological knowledge misses, lacks right now, and uh, a lot of different things. Uh, just to give you an, an example, uh, in order to, to understand what digital tools can do and cannot do, you have to realize what is a binary system and why computers are not analog machines and they cannot replicate our human activities. This is a very fundamental distinction. And all people that are actually afraid right now, computational stuff, if they understand how what, what is binary logic and what, what is an algorithm and why binary logic cannot be exact match of, of our human brain and human consciousness, uh, they will definitely engage with these machines in a much more friendly way. Uh, and these are very basic stuff. And I think this, uh, this kind of, of uh, learning lacks uh, in the in the education of, of language teachers um, and I, I do I do see quite a lot of, of very uh, very I think it's very important for them to go into more technical knowledge uh, not very specialized not computer science masters but uh, definitely a better understanding of how computers work I absolutely agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. I agree with all of you, uh, your views. I don't see any questions, so at least we can also... M Maria, I, I, I think I think there is a one that came about the, the future of the ah, digital no. learner. Okay. 
just came. What about the future digital learner? Can we sketch the profile of the digital learner in the post-pandemic era with regard to motivation for language learning, peer collaborations, etc.? What do you think? I, I think we, we are focusing very much, particularly in research, we're focusing very much on the so-called digital natives. We're focusing on, on people who've grown up with mobile technology, a smartphone in one hand and a tablet in the, in the other. Uh, what the danger is for and a particular concern for me is that we might leave behind the older learners. We've, at, at the Open University, we, we are open to, to all ages. So my, my oldest learner of German was 104 year old when he started. And I really appreciate, I, I love this engagement, this, this motivation, the joy they have in, in learning something new and the enthusiasm with which they, they start on this journey. But in, in a way, if we're pushing too hard on the technology, technology side, there's a danger that we might not lose them because they're incapable, but frighten off learners who have to sort of jump this uh, technological hurdle first before they get to the language learning hurdle. And this, this is uh, one of the aspects I, I think we need to embrace the future digital learner as someone with lots and lots of different needs and, and aspects. And they're not just the, the, the 15 to 18 year olds who really are competent in using a screen and a tablet and, and what, whatever. Uh, but those are also learners who have to learn how to not just understand how a computer works, but even how a mouse works and, and how to access uh, an online site and take the the fear and, and this, this sort of anxiety away from them, that this, this might be something that's beyond them or too difficult for them. It's not. They can do it, but we need to, to plan for them as well. Absolutely. Okay. If I could, can I jump in? <laughs> Absolutely. <Yes. laughs> of course. <laughs> I'll wave my hands. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's the other side of the coin here too, and that's the myth of the digital native. Just because all these young people have smartphones and tablets and know how to use them does not mean that they know how to use them to learn anything or that they are inclined to use them to learn anything. Uh, they have to be taught. If the older people have to be taught to learn the technology, the younger people have to be taught how to use the technology as well for learning purposes. They use it for entertainment, they use it for communication. Uh, but uh, there, there's a job to be done on, on both ends of the, of the spectrum, not just the uh, aged people like ourselves here. Okay. okay. Ha, I'm <laughs> jumping <laughs> also. <laughs> okay. Uh, look, uh, Jack, uh, I was wondering all my time, uh, like the last years, what's my difference, uh, me as a, uh, as a learner, uh, compared to a, a real digital native learner, right? And I couldn't really uh, tell the difference, right? Because more or less, uh, I'm very much into technology. So why uh, a kid that has been born in 2010, for example, is like different than me? So uh, I attended a, a reunion in MIT Media Lab a uh, couple of years ago. And uh, there was a very uh, funny place there. People had brought kids. Of course, all of us were like, you know, super involved in uh, AI, machine learning. We were discussing algorithms, all this classic stuff we do, the nerdy stuff. <laughs> so um, at a specific point, there's a kid coming into uh, his father, a Korean one. And... Um, at that time, we had a photo, an actual photo, not a digital one, an actual photo. And we were uh, uh, saying, oh, my God, you, you, you really got old and all this stuff. And we were seeing this uh, ourselves before, like, 20 years. And took the kid, the, the photo, here's a photo, let's say, and started to do like that, you know, the gesture. <laughs> And started crying, Daddy, Daddy, does not work this. Does not work. And then I realized what is a digital native and yeah. what is not. So it's 
I, I've seen children do that too, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, I realized that, no, I'm, I'm different. <laughs> My brain is different, differently hardwired. And we definitely have to think a lot of about uh, digital natives. And I'm pretty sure that uh, fMRIs and all cognitive neural labs and uh, research that can be done right now will will definitely show a different way that they perceive and they understand and they uh, learn acquired knowledge and language in, in many uh, aspects. So I think this is a uh, future learner uh, should also be fed with different educational material. That's it. Wonderful. So, uh, if I may, Maria, could I of ask course, a question <laughs> as well? Of course, my dear. Okay, so um, as we said, during these two years, we all experienced this disruption of education in, in, in different parts of the globe. And this transition to online modes of teaching was, in, in many cases, it was a, viol a violent one. Um, since the majority of teachers, as you said, were not prepared for this, and in most educational institutions, they did not even have the infrastructure or the equipment to do that. Now, my question is the following. In this context of change, in this context of social distancing and basically of physical distancing, distancing do you see an opportunity for virtual um, uh, learning environments to replace the actual classroom environments? And I'm not referring to replacement of the teacher. I'm referring to, you know, online modes being um, let's say, uh, um, implemented in our teaching. What do you think? Is online here to stay, let's say, in, in simple words? Can, can I just change the, <laughs> the sequence of yes, intervention, yes. Ellis? Mm -hmm. So um, I would say one thing, that right now, if you see the active calls of the European Union, the Horizon program, Extended reality is in the forefront. And uh, being there and being this uh, think tank groups where we're actually seeing what is coming, uh, it seems like a gamification, extended reality, in language learning, these two things uh, packed up together uh, seem to be the future. At least Europe will fund a lot of new projects on that. And uh, it's here for, to stay, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I will also add here a comment. I see a discussion coming here from Christine and Carol. Uh, they talk about, uh, uh, they, uh, Christine said, uh, many children with learning difficulties can navigate uh, all these tools better than us. And Carol said that she agrees with Christine. And there seems to be very limited research into language learning and students with learning difficulties. It needs to be explored because in my experience, she says, it can make a world of difference. Uh, she's a, a special educator. Uh, so this is also a, a very, very useful comment for uh, you know um, the learner and the abilities and the future. and. Uh, uh, in uh, in a way, yes, it is. Uh, the re this is what the research shows, and uh, I'm not a specialist in that. Uh, but um, I have I have uh, a knowledge. But um, if you want, uh, you can always uh, talk. If you would like to ask anything to our uh, <laughs> speakers here or to share your views, if this is, we can pass the word to you, the word to you. So, uh, if you would like to also to to jump in <laughs> to our discussion, you can please just, uh, you can tell us and we can give you also the right to, to speak. Um, Maybe a word from, from my perspective as a, at, at the Open University. Of course, we, we don't teach children, we teach adults from, from the age of 17 on, onwards. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm myself, I haven't worked with uh, special educational needs, but we do have specialists who look at that. and. In the in the past years, we, we've seen the number of uh, students who declare special needs going up from normally about 
10, 12 percent, up to 30 percent in our language classes. So it's, it's not that they have more needs, it's that they declare the needs more openly. And I think that's, that's extremely helpful for us as well. When we prepare our materials, we need to be aware of the different needs um, from physical disabilities to anxieties and, and other conditions that make it impossible or very difficult for them to communicate in the way that the language teacher of the past would have created their fictitious learner and written the, the materials for them. So I, th I think there is a change coming there as, as well. Thank you very much, Christine, for, for that contribution. Thank you so much, Susi. Uh, Alice, would you like to, to read the next uh, question that we got from the audience? Yes, there are two more questions. Um, the first one is, what is your opinion on implementing offline pedagogical tools in, in an online environment? For example, give us uh, yeah, yeah, for, sorry. For example, how effective is the use of theater tools in blended learning pedagogy? I'll wait for any technology expert to answer that because I, I'm totally baffled. <laughs> what do you mean by theater tools? <laughs> Teach me something. You are very welcome to switch on your microphone and, and speak. Okay, yeah, fine. Uh, what I meant with theater tools is like, for example, using a role plays or a tableau or a mime or maybe an uh, you know, impromptu skit. So can we use such kind of tools in online environment? Because definitely, as you all rightly saying that we are in a new normal and we have to move to the online education system in the near future. So I'm just curious about can we use the same offline tools in online environment also? Thank you. Yeah, yes, definitely. Uh, students use their mobile phones or tablets to uh, record uh, uh, skits, uh, role plays, uh, uh, whole plays. Uh, they they uh, can rehearse them, they can practice them, they can come back into class and, and, and play them for people in class. Uh, yes, you'll find, uh, check my bibliographies, uh, look for that. I think you'll find some examples of it uh, there. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have also another comment uh, from Irini. Uh, I think that distant learning can be implemented in order to take advantage of courses from all over the world for all over the world, which before the pandemic was uh, occurring on a limited scale. So distant learning, it can be represent an opportunity to increase learning. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and this is the, the win here let's say if we have to see a positive aspect is just uh, uh, this one it's a wonderful thing uh, that you know all this situation brought us together I didn't I want to, to also to 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 add here a, a comment uh, uh, in the context of uh, our project the DC for LP a project we have, we were supposed to organize face-to-face uh, -face tra training sessions uh, in three different countries and to deliver this training to specific groups of teachers in these uh, specific uh, uh, let's say countries Cyprus uh, Greece and uh, Nor uh, Norway what happened is that everything went online so uh, we planned everything <laughs> again in a different way. And uh, we delivered all uh, the webinars uh, and all our training sessions on, uh, online. And what happened is that uh, we saw and we met people from all the parts of the world. I can tell you from Madagascar, from uh, South America, you cannot imagine Australia, from all over the place, from uh, Arabic uh, countries. And for us, it was such a big gift. And uh, when I saw, for example, when we saw that uh, people were up at six o'clock in the morning to do training, online training, they said, thank you so much because it is free and we have the ability to do training. And we have so much need to do training during these hard times that we, we have. For us, it was uh, such a, a, a gift even in these difficult times that uh, we all uh, have, 
uh, this communication with um, uh, all the teachers around the world gave us, um, I don't know, motivation and uh, get, makes, made us um, stronger. And I would like, I really want to thank all the people who came to all uh, our uh, webinars, uh, and there were many. <laughs> so thank you so much. Please, Yushi. <laughs> And thank you for doing that. That was an, a round of applause for you and for, <laughs> for all your team. Because <laughs> I, I know from thank you. Exactly. how much that was needed in, in the difficult times. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Of course, we thank the team and the, everyone. But uh, yes, I mean, it's uh, emotional. I, I, I must say that uh, you feel uh, when someone said to us, you know, uh, we are not allowed to have training because we are uh, uh, ladies. And it's difficult to have, you know, in the Arabic world, it, there are some issues there. So in, we now can do that. It was also another thing that it was like, oh, my God, is it possible? So you could also feel the different cultures. And what you said before, Lucy, about this, you know, the exchange, not of only of, uh, you know, uh, uh, language learning and all that. It's about culture. It's about um, our lives, in fact, we bring in our lives in these uh, uh, in these sessions, even during our lessons. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for uh, thank all you. this contribution, and to all of you that, who came today, who joined us from different uh, countries and uh, shared your views. It was um, amazing, and uh, we are happy. It is recorded, so we can see <laughs> it again, watch it again, and share it to the world to to watch also. Thank you Thanks, all. Maria. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you.